All right, buenas tardes a todos, que Dios los bendiga, bienvenidos. Es un honor tenerlos, gracias por acompañarnos en este hermoso día que el Señor nos ha dado. Praise God for this beautiful day that the Lord has given us. Let us, um, let us go to God in prayer so that we can get started. Amen. Oramos, Father, we come before you. First and foremost, God, just to pause, to be still, and to know that you are God, to declare and proclaim that you and you alone are God, that you are good, that you are worthy to be praised. Thank you for the honor and the privilege that you give us. God, to pause one more time, to dedicate our thoughts, to incline our minds, our hearts, God, to be in your presence today with the sole intent of worshiping your name, of lifting your name up on high, God, and um, and just posturing ourselves in a, in a, God, in a way that, that we, God, we're open for you to speak to us, to minister to our hearts, and God, we want to worship your name. So God, we put today's service uh, before you. We pray for all the families that are that are out, um, out of town or other, other places. God, we pray that you be with them, that you protect them, but here in this place, God, we thank you. We thank you that we're being able to, to be here, God, to uh, to enjoy your presence. And we just, God, we ask that you would direct and bless our service today. But above all things, God, I pray that you would receive all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise because you are indeed worthy. So, God, we pray all these things, and we give you thanks, Lord, and we do it all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. Amen. So, yeah, yes.
silence of a heart that believes itself defeated by loss, by pain, by fear. Our hope nailed to a cross, our own faith defeated at the sight of no movement, a body inert. But it is not the end. At the sound of the gravestone rolling, a new story has unfolded. Death has been defeated. Our hope is alive. Jesus is alive. We raise our hands in victory. By his resurrection, we are set free. He blows a wind of life and brings us back to the light. He is risen. Our Messiah is alive. He breathes and the darkness tremble. He speaks and our future shines. By his sacrifice, we are now saved. By his grace, we can all rise. Here rejoicing in the sky, the grave could not hold him. The veil has been torn. Our Christ has won over death, over sin, over ache. By his power, all chains break. He is victorious. He is the way. He is the resurrection and the life. And by his wounds, we're made alive. Praise God. <laughs> All right, well, thank you again for joining us in this beautiful, beautiful day that the Lord has given us. Um, we can go ahead and uh, dismiss the kids to go to their class, and then the youth, they're also going to go um, to have their uh, Bible study. We are going to go ahead and pray and get ready um, to... Um, Study God's Word together, and like every single week, if we have the Bible app, um, there's an event, an event there for you to follow if you want um, notes. I don't think we need. I don't know. Okay. Okay. Um, well, and the other day, uh, I wanted to share a message that I have titled. The people God uses, and um, I wanted to first, I guess I should have done it before dismissing everyone, but um, I wanted to say thank you to everybody that um, that supported, the last two weekends, we had uh, two special services back to back, and we had great turnouts, um, thankfully to Normie's family that came out the week before last, uh, in, in um, in memory of Tatiana, and that was a beautiful uh, time that we had together uh, in order to honor her and, and honor and, and continue to walk through with the Robinson family. So thank you for supporting her in that and being here. And then obviously, and then of course for Easter, thank you to all of you that invited friends and family, and we had a great turnout as well. And um, today, people are taking advantage of the end of uh, spring break to. Uh, take a day off, but um, I'm thankful, I'm thankful to uh, to be here and to start a short series in which we're going to go ahead and finish the book of Genesis. From the beginning of the year, we have been studying the book of Genesis, um, everything from creation to how it was that the book of Genesis came together, how it was written and documented down and, and handed to us. We talked a little bit about the flood and the Tower of Babel. And then uh, right before Easter, uh, we finished a short uh, three-week or four-week series talking about the patriarchs of our faith. We spoke about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But I mentioned that I would like to come back a little bit to the life of Jacob because the life of Jacob, we have a lot of chapters. It's a long story, and I believe that there is a lot there, a lot of practical um, applications, a lot of teachings, and a lot of things that we can embrace and apply into our lives. Um, and um, and we're going to read a, a lengthy portion of scripture in Genesis chapter 25. And I want to invite you to get up on your feet in honor of God's word. We will read the text in its entirety and then we'll take it, you know, a little step at a time and take it apart little by little. But um, 
we are going to go ahead and look at a little bit of the family dynamics that are present in this particular chapter of scripture in Genesis 25, the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is the family that God chose to reveal himself to, to identify himself to, and to identify himself with, because we know that one of the names that the God gives himself is the, the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So we're going to look a little bit at the family dynamics present here in Genesis chapter 25. Starting in verse 29, the word of God says, This is the account of the family line of Abraham's son, Isaac. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean from Badan Aram, and sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. The Lord answered his prayer, and his wife Rebecca became pregnant. The babies jostled each other within her, and she said, Why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire to, of the Lord. The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. Verse 24. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twins in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment, so they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. The boys grew up. And Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once, when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country, famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew I'm famished. This is why he was also called Edom, which means bread. Jacob replied, First, sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, Swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left, so Esau despised his birthright. Praise God for the reading of his word. You may be seated, and let us go ahead and pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, um, God, for the, for the account of, family, of this family um, and families like this one all throughout Scripture that reveal to us the fact, God, that that you use broken people, that you use messed up families. Thank you, um, God, that your word doesn't shy away from the dysfunctions that are present in the family dynamics, God. And I pray that um, for the rest of our time, God, that you would lead us. Through studying this text, I pray that anything and everything I say today are, God, not my thoughts, my words, or my ideas, but help me to simply be an instrument in your hands, God, as we take this apart little by little. And I pray that you would minister to us and that this may be good news, God, that, that in spite of our brokenness and in spite of our deficiencies, our failures, and our dysfunction, God, that you can still use us, use our families, use our homes. Uh, for your glory and our ultimate good. So we commend ourselves to you, and we give you thanks. And God, I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. All right. So I subtitled this um, series, God Uses Messed Up People, right? <laughs> or God Uses Messed Up Families. Yeah. <laughs> 
you know, I, I titled the, the message, The People God Uses, but you see all the broken crayons to symbolize the fact that the people God uses is broken people. And the truth is that he doesn't have a choice because that's all he's got to work with, right? <laughs> it's like when you sit down to color, you don't have a choice but to use the broken crayons because they last about a day, right? I buy my son new school supplies every beginning of the year. And uh, <laughs> by the end of the year, when he brings everything back, everything is toward the shreds. <laughs> um, but that's the, the truth of the matter. Um, God uses broken people and God uses messed up people because... He has no choice. From the beginning, from the first family in human history, we see the dysfunction already there. A nearly perfect family that, of course, fell into sin. And unfortunately, the sin of the first man caused the second man to kill the third man. Right? That's how I teach Ian to remember the story of Cain and Abel. Um, but we see it there. And, and that's actually good news for us because... We all come from some level of dysfunction. We all come from some level of brokenness. Sure, different families are at different levels, for sure, and in different areas. But the truth of the matter is that we are in all the need, messed up in one way, shape, or form. But thank be to God that that's the people God uses. God uses messed up people. Now, obviously, I'm, I'm not trying to offend anyone. Um, and I'm sure that, you know, we would have the tendency to sort of like push back a little bit and say, no, 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 I know messed up people, and that's not me. Like, I know some jacked up families, but we're doing pretty good. But again, we might be in different levels or perhaps in different areas, but we must acknowledge that we've all sinned and we have all fallen short of the glory of God. And the beginning of forgiveness and the beginning of redemption for ourselves and I believe for our families is to indeed acknowledge that we have fallen short. We are messed up. We are broken people, but praise be to God that God can use broken people still. So we're going to look through this text at some things that, um, you know, we, we studied the life of Jacob. The, the narrative of it a few weeks ago, but I want to look at a little bit of the family dynamics that are present in this chapter. For example, I want to talk a little bit about the generational patterns that are present in this text, right? Because the text tells us that this is the account of the family of Abraham's son, Isaac. So Abraham is still in the picture. Now Abraham, he is the father of our faith, as a matter of fact, Abraham is the father of three different faiths, right? Because Abraham is the father of Judaism, of Islam, and Christianity. All three of them consider him the father of their faith. Now, that's about a third of the human population identified with those three different faiths and belief systems. Um, so imagine a third of the whole human population lift up this guy as being important. Of being somebody, obviously we don't worship Abraham, but he is definitely somebody that we esteem, right? Because he was indeed the, 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 the guy that God used in order to bring forth the Messiah. Um, so you would think that this guy that's so important worldwide would have lived a truly exemplary life. And yes, Abraham did show incredible faith in God, believing him and taking him at his word. As he blindly followed God into the wilderness and at 75 years old decided that God was worth trusting and following and living in tents for the, the rest of his life. And his faith was accounted to him as righteousness. But he also sinned in many different ways and in ways that we see that clearly impacted the way the life of Isaac. As a matter of fact, we see in the life of Isaac some ways that he also sinned, that he, he learned from his father or he got from his father or obviously they, they had to tell him about it or he learned about it because he wasn't born when Abraham lied and played that whole, well, she's not really my wife game, right? 
Abraham, I mean, Isaac had been born yet, but we see Isaac repeating that same error and committing that same sin and lying about his wife. And the truth is that that is also true about us. There are things in our life and in our families, things that we saw, things that we learned, things that we experienced. There are things that we um we just learn growing up. Perhaps things that we develop appetites for. Perhaps things that we develop a um, learn to tolerate in our life that that came from our families, from our growing up. Some things are good things, right? But also some things are things that are displeasing to God, and um, they could very well not necessarily be our fault. They were simply handed down. To us by our family members or whatever it is, uh, whether it's you know attitudes or languages or certain phrases that we use, uh, certain idioms or fears, certain likes or dislikes or habits and even addictions, things that are passed down, things that sometimes are even genetics. Some things are things that we saw that we experienced or simply that we learned about and. Um, and again, for, for some of us that, you know, became Christians or are born again, um, you know, with the help of the Holy Spirit, God opened our eyes and we saw and we acknowledged perhaps those things that were, you know, flawed and, and warped and wrong that were part of our past or perhaps part of our growing up or part of our family's, you know, descendancy. And with the help of God, by His grace and, and His Holy Spirit, God has helped us to fight back and God willing really overcome some of those things. However, there are also things in our family's history that are so ingrained in us, in our minds and in our hearts. There's so much part of the fabric of who we are that we live with those things for a long, long time before we even realize that those things are a problem. Even as a Christian, we live with those things, and we don't even know that they're a problem because, again, we have learned to tolerate, we have learned to make excuses for, and we have just learned to think, well, that's just the way that it is. That's just the way that I grew up. That's just the people of where I'm from. That's just in my blood, and we just kind of tolerate those things. Um, but, um, but the truth of the matter is that the real reason for the um, the generational patterns and the real reason for some struggles in our life at the end of the day is just because we were born into a world of dysfunction in general. At the end of the day, we are descendants of Adam. We were born broken, right? We were born in a fallen state. So even though I talk about generational patterns, there is no need to get angry or be bitter about our growing up or be bitter against our family because the truth of the matter is that if you were born to a different family, you would still be broken in a different way. But you would still be broken because we were all born into a dysfunctional, fallen world. But we see generational patterns are a real thing in the life of Abraham and the life of Isaac. But in this particular family, we also see division within the family. We see division within the family. Specifically, mom and dad, they're not on the same page. And we see that clearly in Genesis 25, verses 27 and 28. That says that when the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay home among the tents. Now, Isaac, he loved, he had a taste for wild game, therefore, he loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. So we see Isaac's heart is for one child, while Rebekah's heart is for the other. And as parents, when there is division in our home and when there is favoritism, that will always breed dysfunction. It will always breed Dysfunction, animosity, bitterness, something is going to go wrong because um, because it's, it's not right. 
it's part of the human experience because the truth is that we've all had to experience that in some way because none of us are, you know, identical identities, right? When, when a family comes together, no two people are identity, identical entities, but instead we are two separate, sinful individuals. And when two people come together to make a family, that's two sinners that come together to make a family. It doesn't matter how well you get along. You put two people together, you double the amount of sin within <laughs> that household because that's the way that our human experience works out. And, and we've had this fight in our home in different ways, whether Joanna disciplines Ian and tells him one thing, and then he comes to me because I don't know what she told him, so I say another thing, right? Because he's uh, sneaky like that. Or she's hard on one area, and I'm a little bit softer with him or whatever. And again, there's division in our discipline of our son. And because of that division, and because we are not on one page, again, there is conflict. So it's not good. It's not good because... Um, when there is this unity, uh, again, it just breeds dysfunction. It just, it just doesn't work out. And that's actually one of the reasons why when God teaches about marriage, he, he teaches husband and wife, you have to submit to one another, right? Wives, submit to your husbands as unto Christ. And husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. There is a submission that's part of both parties in order for us to get along in, in a different context. And this was part of a whole different conversation, but the, the principle stands true. These are the words of Jesus that every city or house divided against itself, it will not stand. It will not stand. There's going to be division. There's going to be dysfunction. There's going to be brokenness. And um, as a matter of fact, this is also true when it comes to our faith. That's why in the words of Paul, he also commends us as followers of Christ and believers to not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Listen to his words. He says, What fellowship do righteousness and iniquity have? Or what fellowship does light have with darkness? You see that division. There's, there's just two parties that are divided. That's just not going to go well. So division within the family, you have generational patterns. Lastly, within this particular family, we see sibling rivalry. Sibling rivalry. With these particular siblings, the whole rivalry actually started from within the womb. I mean, in the womb, they were already fighting, right? Verse 22, the babies jostled each other within her. And she said, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord, I can only imagine how painful it must be um, to be in constant competition. And, you know, competition and, and rivalry against a sibling. Thankfully, I have been blessed by my family, by my in-laws, by my, um, you know, my uh, means, uh, cuñados, brother-in-law, right? Um, but, you know, you see this, you see this often where where siblings are fighting or there's rivalry, there's competition either for um, fighting for either their parents' attention or their parents' approval. Um, you see this rivalry at times competing financially or professionally where there's like, they might not say something, but oh, they got a better job or higher pay. Well, I need to do this, or you bought a new car, or well, I'm gonna buy this car, you bought this house, and there's this, there's this competition between, at times even relationally, where my kids are better than her kids, or my kids do better in sports than his kids, and there's just a rivalry and some type of competition that takes place. And while at times it can be good, to have a person that perhaps you look up to, that perhaps challenges you to to do better, to to um, you know to try harder, to grow, to develop, right? That can be good. It's also really really sad when families fall apart because of these rivalries, because of these fights, right? Where they these families where they don't no longer talk to each other, 
or their relationship completely breaks over money, or they went into business together and you moved acuerdo or whatever it is, and, and the families just break apart where brothers and sisters don't talk to each other, mom and dad don't talk to each other. This is so sad. This happens a lot when an, an inheritance is in the middle where brothers are fighting over who gets what, and there's bitterness, and there's fights, and there's unforgiveness, and that is so, so sad. Um, and we see, we see this dynamic in Scripture, and God still used this family, right? Now, we know that the first um, rivalry in the Bible, uh, it wasn't, you know, with Jacob and Esau. The first sibling rivalry was actually with the first siblings ever to exist with Cain and Abel, and you remember how that ended. Prove it again that the fall is something real. That proving again the effects of our fallen state because nobody has to teach us to be selfish. Nobody has to teach us to be prideful. Nobody has to teach a child how to be envious, right? Um, and uh, we're just born in a fallen state. We also know from the story of Abraham that Isaac also had a brotherly and a, and a sibling rivalry with his stepbrother, Ishmael. If you remember, Ishmael was the son that Abraham had with Hagar, which was Sarah's servant, trying to force the will of God, doing it his own way. And uh, he had this other kid named Ishmael. And God told him, no, 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 that's not who I'm going to fulfill this promise to. He's the son of your flesh. He's not the son of promise. And, and God only knows how Isaac's relationship or lack thereof relationship with Ishmael, perhaps the way that he thought about his stepbrother, perhaps the, word, the way that he talked about his stepbrother, what kind of impact that had in the life of Jacob and Esau. Again, that's not told in Scripture, but we know that all of that is part of the family dynamic. That's all the generational pattern. And all of it has an effect. The things that children see, the things that they hear, the things that they experience. So again, we see that this is a messed up family. I mean, these are things just over the top. But these are some of the final like that, that the family dynamics that we see in the chosen family. Add to that all of the, you know, because that's all... That's all part of the whole family, but add to that all the personal baggage that each of these characters are dealing with. For example, Rebecca, she was dealing with infertility, right? Rebecca was dealing with her personal struggle. Uh, the, the text told us that Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebecca, and that he prayed in behalf of his wife, because she was childless. Now the text also told us that Isaac was 60 years old when Isaac was born. So that was a 20 year span with a struggle with infertility. And we know how much stress and how much tension infertility can bring to the family, can bring to the marriage. Um, at this time, the cultural significance was also weighty because at this time, infertility was considered to be a curse. It was considered to be, you know, almost like a curse from God. So imagine how she felt about herself, how she felt not enough of a woman to provide or whatever. If that wasn't enough, the text is clear that Sarah had already died, but Abraham was well around. And again, we studied the life of Abraham, how he had to wait 25 years for his promise to come along. So he had to deal with all this. And he made sure that he crossed the T's and he dotted the I's. And he found a wife for his son from his family lineage. I mean, he did everything almost to say, okay, I did my part. Now you go. Now you go and do it. God is going to fulfill his promise now through you. And then has to wait another 20 years. And again, imagine the stress on Isaac and on Rebecca and the comments, perhaps. Did you leave your socks on? Try it with your socks on, right? Like, <laughs> all the unsolicited advice. 
that at times can come from in-laws that they didn't ask for, but they're going to give their opinion anyway, right? And, and imagine all of that, how that affected her. Imagine her stress. Imagine her feelings throughout 20 years worth. So she's dealing with infertility. We see Isaac. Um, he's perhaps dealing with maybe some bitterness. He's struggling through some levels of rebellion and his flesh in general. What do I mean? Well, the text in, in the beginning of this chapter, like I said, Sarah had already passed away. In the beginning of chapter 25, it says that Abraham, he had taken another wife whose name was Keturah. Now, we know from Abraham's life that he was 100 years old when Isaac was born. Um, Sarah passed away a few years after that. We, we think, or scholars are in agreement, that he was about 135 to about 140 years old when he married this other wife. And then it says here that she bore him Zimra, Jokshan, Medan, Midian, Ishra, Shua, right? So imagine Isaac is 60. Close to 60, now you're gonna have kids and now a 140-year-old dad <laughs> is having a bunch of kids, now you got a bunch of infant uncles and dads. Like, I mean, imagine what's going through his mind and he's struggling with all of this. Add to that the fact that, again, we go back to talk about his stepbrother Ishmael. I, I try to look up, you know, when Ishmael had kids in relation to, you know, Jacob and Esau being born, I couldn't find anything, but we know that Ishmael was about 30 years older than Isaac. So we know that definitely he probably had kids beforehand. But again, this is talking about Ishmael's descendancy. This is the story of the generations of Ishmael, Abraham's son with, with uh, Hagar the Egyptian, the you know Sarah's servant. It says, these are the names of the sons of Ishmael. Their names, according to their order of their birth, the firstborn of Ishmael, Neb Nebaioth, and then Kadar, and Abdiel, and Mishbon, and Isaac, I'm sure, is going, wait a minute, I'm the son of promise. I'm the one whose descendants are supposed to be a blessing to the entire world, and here's my dad having a bunch of kids. God has definitely blessed my brother, even though he was the son of the flesh, so Isaac is dealing with some type of Rebellion, and the, the, the reason I say that is because we saw from the text that when Rebecca was pregnant, God prophesied over her and over her children, right? Two nations are in your womb. Two peoples will be separated from your, from your body. The one people will be stronger than the other. The elder will serve the younger. That was a prophecy of the Lord over her, about her children. However, we see Isaac is bent on having his favor, right? He's bent on blessing the older child, even though God said otherwise, right? And, and why? Because again, in his rebellion, he is simply, um, he just simply listening to his flesh. And we saw that from the description that we heard where it says that Esau was a skillful hunter and because Isaac Loved, what was it? Because he loved the venison and the wild game that Esau hunted. So I'm just dependent on what, because I like the food that he brings, because I like how it tastes, because it's pleasing to my flesh. No, 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 I'm blessing this child. It doesn't matter what God said, right? I, I'm overpassing it, I'm over um, looking the promise of God. So again, we see some type of rebellion, we see. Um, uh, him battling with his flesh again in telling his son, you know, this is in, in chapter 27, where he takes, tells him, hey, go prepare, prepare um, the kind of tasty food that I like and bring it to me uh, to eat so that I may give you the blessing before I die. Again, just focusing on his flesh because I like the food that I eat, because I like these things. I'm going to bless you again, ignoring. Um, what God had already declared over these two boys. And again, we see that, again, in the life of Abraham. Again, trying to force 
the will of God, where God said, no, 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 Ishmael is the son of your flesh. He's not the one that I'm going to bless. You're trying to do things in your way. In the same way, we see Isaac, again, ignoring the promise of God and doing things in the flesh. The third person in the story, again, we see Esau. And we see, again, his rebellion against God. We see his rebellion against uh, his spiritual responsibilities. Obviously, he was an impulsive fellow, right? From the story that we know that he was just so exaggerating his hunger that he was sparing his time about to die, right? <laughs> but again, we see in the text that Esau despised his birthright. He despised his birthright. And again, it makes us wonder how much of that impulsivity, how much of that, I got eat right now, did he pick up from his dad, right? How much did he get that from just the family dynamics? We know, and we've studied before, how in this culture the birthright was very important indeed. It was the first fruit, and it was considered the most desirable. It was considered uh, sanctified and set apart for the Lord and for the purposes of God. When it came to children... Obviously, within the word, the birthright, it was given to the eldest child, and um, it gave the eldest child, once the parent and the father would have passed away, would give them the name, the authority, and the responsibility. Um, it would have given him a double inheritance than the rest of his brothers, but along with that, it also carried a spiritual responsibility, because the one with the birthright would also have to become the spiritual leader of the family. That was part of their responsibility. And again, much like his daddy, Esau was driven by his flesh and by his appetite. And um, when, uh, when it came to, um, you know, to, to the birthright, he basically just despised it. He didn't, he didn't even, uh, think about it, and Jacob bargained with him, and he just kind of gave it away. Now, I studied this a little bit deeper, and we have talked about this story before, so I just read a little bit of um, commentaries, no, not so much about the human aspect of the story, but a little bit of the devotional and the theological, and there is a powerful symbolism that we see in this text, and I thought it was interesting. For example, when the text told us that God declared over Rebecca, two nations are in your womb, two peoples will be separated in your body. Uh, some commentaries talked about how this is also representative and a picture of the two natures that live within the believer. The two natures that live within the Christian person, right? And like Esau and Jacob, is again a picture of before we came to Christ, right? That's Esau. And a picture of when we give our life to Jesus, that would be Jacob. And then the battle in between those two natures, because that's the truth of the matter. We have two natures. We have a sin nature, but then when we're born again, a, a new nature is born. It is a spiritual nature. So again, our life, is also like a twin. We have a, a battle in between us where there is an old self and then a younger self. For example, my flesh and my sinful nature was born in January 15, 1978, but my spiritual self wasn't born until the year 1998, right? So my flesh has a 20 year <laughs> head start from my spiritual self, and there is a battle going on, right, between my old self, my sinful self, and my spiritual flesh, because one is younger than the other, and just like Jacob was reaching and holding on to the, um, the ankles of Esau growing up, oftentimes in our life, that's what we're doing, our spiritual self is reaching over, trying to get ahead, right? And, and why do I like sin so much? Because my old self loves it, right? Because my flesh loves to sin. 
So uh, my spiritual sense keeps on reaching, trying to get ahead. But praise be to God for this prophecy and for the truth that the day will come where the elder will serve the younger. Amen? Amen. The elder will indeed submit to the younger and our spiritual self will indeed overcome. And that's what we're living through right now through the process of sanctification where slowly we're learning to get ahead and submit the old flesh, right? And make it submit so that our spiritual nature can overcome for the glory of God and our good. But again, we see Esau coming in from the fields, starving. Um, and again, Jacob uh, bargains with him. And uh, this is the exchange, right? And he said, uh, give me some stew. And Jacob tells him, well, first, what are you some of your birthright? And again, here we see the exaggeration. Well, what, what good is this to me? I'm about to die. Um, but Jacob said, well, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread, some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Now, again, I've often heard about you know, Jacob was deceitful and manipulative. I've said it from here. I've preached that as well. But the truth of the matter is that, yes, Jacob took advantage of his brother's hunger, but he hardly had to convince Esau to give it up. He despised it. He didn't really care much about it. You can have double the inheritance? Sure, I don't care. I just want what is what I want right now, what my flesh desires. Right now, I want to eat something. And again, let me assure you, this, this would have been the only time when Jacob was privy to Esau despising or dissing, you know, not caring about his birthright. The way that he lived, and, and again, I saw a bunch of other stuff that we don't have time to cover, but again, that wouldn't have been the first time. That's why Jacob saw the time, and Jacob wanted to please God and serve the Lord, but he had his struggles of maybe some pride, some personal ambition of, yeah, I want to honor the Lord, but I don't want to wait for him to do it. I want to bend God's arm and do things my way, carry out his own will, trying to carry out God's will his own way, which we all know how to do in one way, shape, or form. But Jacob, again, he also had his struggles. Because like we saw earlier, God had prophesied uh, that Jacob would succeed Isaac. He would be, right, the older would submit to the younger. He would be more powerful. He would be the spiritual leader. God had prophesied that. But that covenantial blessing that God gave, it was supposed to be a gift to be received. Not a prize to try to win. Not a prize to try to earn or to grasp or to take take it, right? But simply something by faith that I believe from the Lord. And as a result of both Jacob and Rebecca's deception, we know, and we'll talk a little bit next week, that Jacob had to spend 20 years um, alienated from his family. 20 years away from his family's land or from his father's land. Um, which, of course, got used as part as, of his maturity and his growing and his development. And, um, and we'll, we'll talk about that last, next week. But, but again, we see all the different, you know, faults and failures and dysfunctions that are part of this family, that are part of each of these lives. But God used them still. God used them still. That's what I want us to walk away from, that that. Today, I want us to walk away with the hope and the promise that God indeed uses broken people. He uses broken people because that's all he's got. And that's what we are. He has no choice in the matter. Um, but most importantly, and I want to close with this. If you, as we talk today about all the different family dynamics and all the different levels of dysfunctionality and everything else, if you grew up or you identify with some of this and you have these memories of 
growing up and maybe some failures and some things that you experienced, some things that you witnessed, things that you saw, that you heard. Perhaps you grew up in a dysfunctional family or perhaps your kids are making bad choices. If there was or there is no peace, no love, no fear of God in your home, first I want to say I'm sorry. I want to say that there is hope, but I also want to to emphasize the fact that for us to think that the reason for that is because of our bad choices or because of our failure as parents, it's a form of idolatry. It's a form of idolatry because what we're ultimately saying is if my children are making bad choices or, or, or there's dysfunction in my home, what we're saying is well, the answer is me. It's up to me for my, what my family, what my kids need is me to be more effective. It's for me to make better choices. It's for me to be a more responsible parent instead of saying what they need is Christ and his cross. I'm not the answer. I, my parenting is not the answer. Yes, let's be responsible. Yes, let's be as good parents as we can. But there is nothing that we can do that's going to negate the effects of the fall. There is nothing that, that, that can change the fact that we are fallen beings. And the answer is not in a better program. The answer is not in a better curriculum. The answer is not in us making a better schedule and being more strict and more rules or whatever. What our kids need, what our families need, and ultimately what we need is Christ. What we need is the gospel. And this is important because it's a form of idolatry. When we want the best, is because, and yes, if the, mean, if the means are there and the, the, the sources are there, let's give our kids the best education and let's put them in the best programs and let's do all those things, but none of it is going to save their soul. It doesn't matter how educated they are. It doesn't matter how it's, you know, successful or how great a job they have. What they need is Christ and what they need is the gospel because that's the only thing that's going to save them. Not a relationship, not a better spouse, not more rules, not more discipline. What they need is Christ. What they need is the gospel because only Jesus, only by his grace, his power, and his presence in our lives, and in our children's lives, and in our homes, and in our families, only, only Christ, and only the gospel can save us, and transform us, and can redeem us. And I want to close again by revisiting this verse one last time, because in this prophecy that God declared over the life of Jacob and Esau, I want you to notice that God prophesied that between these two boys, there's two nations, and then he says that these two people are going to be separated, right? Which we already talked about how that's an imagery and a symbolism for our these two natures that are inside of us. But notice it says one people will be stronger than the other people. But it doesn't say which people is going to be stronger. So who is going to be stronger? And I submit to you that is the one that we feed. The one that we feed is the one that will be stronger. Now, ultimately, if you are in Christ, again, I, I, I want to reiterate, yes, ultimately, the elder will submit to the younger, and our flesh will submit. One day we'll be glorified in the presence of the Lord. But in the meantime, as we bring glory to God, as we experience transformation in our lives and in our families, as we witness to our children and all of those things, how can we do that? Well, the one that we feed, that's the one that's going to be stronger. So I pray that uh, in spite of our brokenness, that we will embrace the fact that we are broken, but worship God still because he uses. That's the people that God uses. The people that God uses is people like us. So praise be to God for his grace and for his mercy that he uses messed up people like us. Amen. 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 Father, I worship you and I thank you. For God, one more day that we get to gather to study the word, got to revisit these familiar stories. For God, I pray that once again your spirit, your Holy Spirit, will go beyond my words, will speak to us and minister to us where we are. God, and I just
just pray that um, as we talk today about all of these family dynamics, God, may we just embrace your presence, your promises, and may we submit to you, um, God, our responsibility as, as fathers, as, as mothers, as husbands, as wives. God, may we trust you and depend on you and not carry the guilt and the shame of our failures and our past mistakes, but instead, God, just live for you and, and, and be light and darkness and witness to our kids because ultimately, God, what they need is Christ. What we need is, is Jesus because only you transform us. And while, yes, we ask that you would, God, you would equip us to be the best parents that we can, the best husbands and the best wives that we can, the best siblings, God, the best sons and daughters. But at the end of the day, God, everything that we do, help us to point people to Christ because only you can transform, only you can save, only you can redeem us and save us. So God, I pray all these things and I thank you, God, that, that you use broken people. We acknowledge our brokenness and we thank you that in Christ, we are whole. And God, I pray all these things that I give you thanks and Lord, I do it all in Jesus' matchless name. Amen. 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 Praise God. All right. Well, thank you for joining us today. Que Dios les bendiga. Have a great rest of your day and a beautiful uh, rest of your Sunday. And we will see you el domingo que viene. Que Dios les bendiga. Amen.